I don't think there's any point in my repeating the, <laughs> the caterpillar's question, since most of you heard, heard them already. Um, but I will still do the same thing, which is, who are you? And would you please introduce yourself and say what's the primary quick comment on, on this theme that Gert set out, which is preparing next generations for leadership and service in advancing the convergence between neuroscience, engineering, and medicine towards greater health and wellness for all. Do I get three words? Or? Um, you can, no, no, you can, talk, you can talk for five minutes. I mean, this, okay. is a, this, is a, this was a fairly elaborate, this is almost like a constitution. <laughs> Hi. Anyway, Andrea Chiba. Hello. We'll start. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Cognitive Science and in the program in neuroscience. And I'm a behavioral neuroscientist by training, but I dabble in computation, robots, science of learning, et cetera. Um, in terms of preparing people for the future, I mean, we do that in academics a lot, actually. Um, but something that I've been involved in over the last, I think, 13 years now is the science of learning. And that is building a very, very basic science, the same way that you have science in biomedicine, um, but towards how people and organisms learn, so that we really understand this um, at the very basis. And um, eventually, the idea was to translate that to all sorts of formal and informal educational venues. Um, and um, we're, we're learning all the time. I mean, that's something that the organism does naturally. Um, and it's and and curiosity and learning are are actually something that's embedded in the system. Um, things like education are not embedded in the system; those aren't natural processes. So the idea is how to match these things we need to learn um, to our endogenous system much better. Um, I've also been working on a global science of learning network. Um, to convene all the different um, networks around the world that are interested in the science of learning um, and uh, so that we can have somewhat of a hub and share ideas and learn from other cultures, imagine that, um, and uh, translate ideas. And so that's sort of where I am in this venue. Um, in terms of attaching all these different disciplines, that happens naturally. Um, you have organisms that learn from... Um, you know, from the synapse all the way up to the social system and to the culture. Um, so that's embedded within this. Um, engineering systems and technology have been a huge source for this. You can't study these things without very excellent technologies, actually, because if you want to study anybody in a natural system, and I mean semi-natural system, um, you really can't use all the invasive methods that people like me have been trained to use in their careers um, for doing things like animal studies and very cute human neurobiological studies. You really have to be able to understand how you can grasp those internal signals from everything we have from the outside. And everything's interconnected, so that's a really fun puzzle um, in my book. And one thing that I'm very interested in doing also is once you figure out all those signals, Biofeedback is something that works great. We know that. You can use these as teaching signals for individuals and for groups also because you can be obsessively monitoring every little thing all the time or we can learn how to bring those things together and teach people how to feel those things internally also. So things like compassion training, et cetera, sure, technology can help. There are many people that can't feel their own heartbeats. That's one of the most basic things, heart rate, respiration rate. That's throughout the brain. If you record in a rat's brain and you look at respiration rate, you see those signals. You see the respiratory signals and the respiratory rhythms in the hippocampus, which is a major learning structure. You see it in the cortex. These things about us that oscillate and that we share with others because we key onto others' physiology are absolutely intrinsic. Um, to brain function in the system. And these are things we can learn to regulate also, and we can learn to change them, just like people do in meditation, um, to different states for various types of learning, et cetera, ways of coordinating with each other better. Everything um, involves timing in the world. So those are the sorts of things that I'm quite interested in. Yeah, um, and just before we move on, just to say that it's, you, you should know that this was a very unusual um, person that, uh, who's extremely good at organizing um, 
lots of people all come together from different disciplines and um, science of learning, the timing is everything notion, the music was important. Tim Mullen was here earlier. I mean, he was at the music meetings as well. Uh, the, the mission of the collaboratory I mentioned to you before was to, was to bridge the chasm between the creators and consumers of science and technology. And Andrea was very um, helpful in getting me started. We did a meeting called MEET, M-E-E-T, Meeting on the Ethics of Emerging Technologies, and used this whole polymathics protocol that we talked about, which is the ethics, history and philosophy of science, technology, engineering, law, politics, economics, and business communications, and the wider arts and humanities. So that I get kind of used to being told, you're all over the map. And the answer to which we have is, yes. That's exactly where we need to be at this point, with expert guides. And these are the expert guides. Thank you very much. Al, Thank you. So, so let's, let's, next one. Vaughn. Now you have to say, who are you? And why are you here? <laughs> and why, why am I here? Yes, and what, what, do, you, what do you want to achieve? What? Okay, uh, and related to biomedical engineering education. I'm just trying to get it. Yeah, to the, to the, to the basic theme that, that, um, that Gert had set out earlier about the use of, I'll read it again, preparing next generations for leadership in service in advancing the convergence between neuroscience, engineering, and medicine towards greater health and wellness for all. Okay. Well. Uh, in three sentences. In three sentences. All right, I'll try my best. Uh, <laughs> with an actual government federal bill attached to it. <laughs> um, okay, I'll try to answer that question to the best. Uh, so my name's Adam Lee. Um, I'm a PhD student at Johns Hopkins, and I did my undergrad here at UCSD. Um, I guess to, like, I'm, so I'm working with Sri Sarma, who spoke earlier this morning, uh, specifically on epilepsy and trying to improve seizure outcomes. Um, or surger, surgical outcomes for epilepsy patients. And so I'm really interested in just, you know, utilizing the technological advances that we currently have, you know, going on in Silicon Valley, going on in other parts of industries to make advances in healthcare in general. That's sort of where I'm passionate about. And sort of, I think, for me, two things that we can improve for the next generation is, uh, one, education. Uh, sort of outreach of STEM to people that may or may not, you know, know that they're interested in it. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do is um, me and a couple of colleagues, we got a Whitaker Foundation to start a basically social media digital storybook called Everyday BME, where we highlight everyday BME stories about what they're doing, whether they're from France, they're from U.S. or from Taiwan, et cetera, you name it. And I think this is just utilizing modern day technology to educate everyday high schoolers, undergrads, whatever, about you know, how science is being pursued on an international scale. And I guess the second thing is um, just being aware of yourself and uh, really pursuing mentorship. Uh, so I don't think I would have been here today if it wasn't for you know, guidance of UCSD faculty and, you know, I work with Todd here, and he was really helpful in supporting me when I had no idea what I wanted to do. And then Sri's been awesome as a mentor at Hopkins. And, you know, without finding mentors, I don't think you can really develop into, quote, unquote, next generation sciences. Okay, very cool. Should we stop for a moment and just look happily at you? <laughs> <laughs> Such a nice guy. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Judith. I'm also a PhD student. Um, I'm at the MIT Media Lab. Um, so my background is actually a little bit different from people here. My background is in uh, mostly it's human-computer interaction, so uh, user interface design. Um, I studied multimedia engineering, um, mostly focused on computer science, but also design and uh, audiovisual communication. So for me, I think one of the key uh, pieces in the future of uh, 
uh, the next generation is to have a multidisciplinary background. So I believe like in order to integrate all these disciplines, we definitely need also uh, design as well. Uh, in the user experience, how do we create this, uh, these technologies and how are they presented to the user? Uh, it's really important. And uh, I've been also very interested in how to promote diversity um, in computer science, especially in engineering. Um, so I've been involved in the Society uh, for Women Engineers and also I'm really interested in, um, in teaching values beyond technical details but also how as mentors we can promote emotional values and also uh, social values. Um, so I think we should all really consider what, what it's um, to be a teacher beyond just um, the technical skills. And in terms of what I'm doing, my research, maybe you were here for the two-minute pitch. Um, but I'm very interested in creating user interfaces that can promote uh, our, well, our well-being and also uh, mental health in general. Um, so did I answer more or less the question? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to ask you all later on, how will you know if you've achieved what you, what you wish for? I mean, what would that look like? But you can think about that one. Sir. No, 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 we're going back to the start again. You're up. <laughs> I thought I would answer your size question first, which uh, oh. going back some long years ago, um, I was at a party with a career counselor who encouraged everyone to tell us, to uh, announce publicly what their career goals were. And I told her that I wanted to be an NBA basketball player, and she said, next. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, I... So you gave up? I, I, yes, I gave up. <laughs> I, I, I could jump up and touch the net. <laughs> That's good. Anyway, uh, I have a little bit different background. I was going to put uh, a little bit of a kind of the mechanics or the business end of, of education out there. Uh, among the weird things of my background, I'm actually a, a certified high school teacher in the state of New York. Uh, I was the associate head of the electrical engineering department at Illinois with uh, only 1,600 undergraduates to advise. Um, started the bioengineering department in Illinois, and so I started a undergraduate program at both Illinois and Florida, which means I've made two undergraduate BME programs, and then I've been involved with the systems major uh, when it was inaugurated here. So I've had this un unusual um, involvement. I've also been chair of a neuroscience program, so I punched my, my uh, credentials on that side. Uh, for a question that the audience might want to think about is my thinking of where careers go in electrical engineering is it's one of the most uh, consistent and integrated disciplines that exists in the sense that uh, students that go off with anything from an associate's to a postdoc can work in the same field. The research that faculty do is co very congruent with what industry does. Uh, you can move laterally uh, depending on your skill set and interests mm. from one of these levels to another. And that rarely exists in most other fields, uh, including most of engineering. And bioengineering is, is not nearly as as uh, uh, seamlessly integrated as, as electrical engineering is in, in that sense. Uh, most uh, uh, of the undergraduates do not go on to graduate school at Illinois and ECE. It was like 20% were going on. Everybody, most everybody else is going on to industry and bioengineering. I think it's still something like 25% or 20% are going to med school and probably about 30 or 40% on to grad schools. It's a little different uh, proposition. But a question would be uh, where we're seeing this growing industry in this and neural engineering, brain computer interface for uh, people that have advanced degrees. What is the, where is the business that uh, attracts people at other levels? Now, Marissa, I'll pick on Marissa, who is one of our first graduates of the biosystems uh, program here. Uh, certainly is gainfully employed and did a great job with her uh, demonstration today. So it's, it's clear that there are jobs, and my question really is one of, is the marketplace for people at all levels in neural engineering, is it increasing, and is it increasing rapidly enough? Because the demand is certainly there. I mean, the, the student interest is just out of sight. And I just wonder about 
where is everybody going to go? Well, is that going to go through the likely path would be for them to start creating startups and actually creating this new interface? Yes. And that's, that. so, the, so the question there is, yes, that's one way. Is, is that enough to be able to? Right. I mean, it's, if you look at it from a placement point of view, there certainly are examples of everything of people being successful. Uh, one of the hallmarks is we have very bright people. You know, and it's it's almost impossible to to do them harm because they're so bright. Uh, but I just wonder about the pathways is, and whether or not this field is expanding fast enough for the fast increasing interest by uh, by students in the area. Okay, we'll take that up some more. Actually, do you want to comment on that or make your own comments yeah, about? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So my name is uh, actually Paul. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the bioengineering department. Um, and just to kind of continue on what, what Bruce was talking about, because um, uh, I've TA'd students in our department and also mentors, uh, undergraduates, um, and even high school students. And, and I think the, the key takeaway uh, to make neuroscience relevant uh, to the next generation is, is to make it, you know, indeed relevant. Uh, it's to put it into a context of the next generation. Um, it's, it's one thing to explain something to someone, um, especially someone who is maybe younger. Um, and it's another thing for them to appreciate it and self-discover it. Um, and so some of the, the high school outreach that we do uh, at the high school level um, with electrophysiology is, uh, you know, we, we bring them into a lab and um, give them uh, these non-invasive patches that they put on and, and some leads and then you know, in, in a matter of minutes, uh, students can see their heart beating in terms of the electrophysiology, and then they can put electrodes on their head um, and, and and see changes in in, in the, the spectra when they close their eyes and um, and so forth. You know, and the responses to stimuli, and and so, you know, I, I strongly believe that when it comes to teaching, uh, seeing is believing. Um, my my background was in in biomedical optics. And what inspired me to actually come to graduate school was, um, you know, building tools to, like, see into the brain. And, you know, uh, doing that unobtrusively is, is a challenge, um, definitely. Um, but, um, yeah, making it relevant, uh, you know, to the next generation, uh, studying the brain is an important thing. Uh, and, and so I think if we can uh, come up with methods for, for first of all, demonstrating that yes, it is possible to uh, to be in charge of your own wellness and your own, um, you know, to be able to sense from your own body using simple tools, then it'll inspire the, the next generation to to study this problem. Yeah. Um, Let's expl explore that a little bit further later on. Let's flip back. Um, what we've been doing is people are introducing themselves. Who are you? Caterpillar's questions and answering this question, this kind of thing, which is. Preparing um, next generations for leadership and service in advancing the convergence between neuroscience, engineering, and medicine towards greater health and wellness for all. Since you're in all of those disciplines, okay. you ought to be able to talk nicely about how they all fit together. <laughs> so we're living through the uh, explosion right now in, in my lifetime of uh, both interest in the brain, neuroscience is expanding, and especially neuro systems neuroscience. We, uh, when I first started neuroscience, uh, all of the molecular and genetic people were getting all of the, the uh, excitement. Um, and that shifted right. now. Uh, and the brain initiative was a big stimulus. Uh, now five years into a 10-year program, and it's attracted not just people from the traditional disciplines, you know, psychology, coxi, and neuroscience, but also from the engineering disciplines. And uh, it, it's really uh, exciting to see that collision. Uh, th that is to say, all of the, the majority of the grants that were given in the first five years were UO1s. This is NIH mechanism. And it requires you have a team. So it's, it's not, you know, uh, for a single lab, it's for a team that has right. to have at least an engineer and uh, a neuroscientist and maybe a computational person. And uh, that has really uh, clicked in the sense that the, 
the students that I know here and elsewhere who have been involved, and of course, you know, when I, you know, the, the labs get the grant. Who does the work? Really, <laughs> it's the uh, the students and the postdocs, right. and, and 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 they're you know they're the ones who are the, the, the enthusiastic and integrative, and they're the ones who are really ha making it uh, uh, kind of a, 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 a new generation. There's a new generation here coming up. Is there an institutional fluidity that has evolved that, that now allows that kind of thing to happen more easily, or is it still uphill? Institutions are the slowest moving things on earth, <laughs> especially academic institutions. Yeah. And uh, we're blessed here at UCSD and UC system in general by having organized research units. And I don't know who set them up, but the idea is th uh, that uh, all of the really exciting things are happening outside the, the disciplines. They're like silos. And physics goes back hundreds of years, biology, chemistry, and those are good. I mean, those are solid. Those are bedrock. But, you know, it's the intersection between these disciplines where, where exciting things are happening. Neuroscience itself is, is a conglomeration of about 20 different disciplines. Yeah. Uh, medical disciplines, uh, bioengineering, all, all sorts of things. But uh, the, the reason why the ORUs are, are really a great idea because it, it creates, uh, it first of all acknowledges that, that, that there's something interesting that it could happen outside of the departments where there are all these, uh, you know, um, feel, you know, you have a feeling you're in a department, you're, you have to be uh, a t a part of that team. But if you can get together with people in other departments, outside the department, and especially if you can hire additional research scientists, you can really build up a, 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 you know, very rapidly uh, a, a, a really great uh, group. And we have that here at the Institute for Neurocomputation. Uh, Gert and I are the co-directors. And there are others. There are a lot of others. Hmm. Uh, by the way, it, it, they, they come very quickly, but they go very quickly. <laughs> That is to say, they, they have a, something called a sunset. And after a few five-year reviews, it's generally they turn over. INC has been going for 30 years, and it's getting stronger and stronger. So <laughs> I think we're on a good roll here. All right. Tom. Who a, are you? I'm a Todd Coleman, professor of the Department of Bioengineering. I, um, uh, I started off as an electrical engineer, bachelor's through PhD. I had absolutely no, in electrical engineering, had absolutely no interest in anything biological all the way through my PhD. And my graduate advisor, Muriel Medard, uh, gave me the best piece of advice in my career when she strongly encouraged me to take a, a delay in the start date before taking my faculty position at Illinois and go do a postdoc in something wildly different. That's all she said. And so uh, a bunch of my buddies out in Boston were doing biomedical related things and they used to tease me all this math that you're learning from information theory. Why don't you use it to benefit mankind somehow? And I'll never forget my, uh, <laughs> my mom, uh, my, you know, it's great when your parents can keep you humble. So my mom was like, congratulations, you got a PhD from MIT, but you're not a real doctor. <laughs> so uh, all those little things, I think, subconsciously had an effect on me exploring doing a postdoc in something biological. I ended up doing neuroscience. But the takeaway lesson from this is that from the very beginning of me playing around in neuroscience, I've uh, felt comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's one of the messages that I like to, to send to my students that are interested in, in doing something that they think can be impactful and that can be fun. And is usually not a linear trajectory. You're, you're going to have some rough times and you need to feel comfortable being able to do that. And some of the students in the audience who took my class know this. They felt uncomfortable uh, because in this, this <laughs> kind of speaks to what Bruce was talking about because um, I used to tell my students that uh, 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 bioengineers, I, I say that all of you guys are underrepresented minorities uh, in the sense that the engineering field as bioengineering began did not respect bioengineering and so that even bioengineering companies would go hire people who had electrical engineering degrees, computer science degrees, everything but bioengineering degrees because they didn't trust that they actually spelled bioengineering with a capital B and a capital E. And so part of my role <laughs> is to try to make sure that that capital E is used and to get our students to feel comfortable being uncomfortable and to get them more engineering rigor because that thought process had already been in my mind from what Bruce alluded to 
When I started my career at Illinois, one of the things I thought was so fascinating was I was on, as an assistant professor, I was on the curriculum committee. I was like, why the hell do they have me on the curriculum committee? But it was so interesting to be a fly on the wall because, as Bruce alluded to, the electrical engineering discipline is very mature, and you have people from different camps, and they would almost come to fisticuffs about how passionate they were about how courses should be taught. And I was like, wow, that is so profound that they care that much about how we train our students to best position them to go into the, into the world. And so uh, now being in a bioengineering department, you know, one of the biggest prides and joys that I have is to see our bachelor's degree carrying students getting jobs at these companies in San Diego, like Marissa here. Stand up, Marissa. And so she got her bachelor's from UCSD, Yay. and who she is here. And so uh, I think Bruce brings up a really good point because if we take a look at like the deep learning and how Google acquired Jeff Hinton's company or et cetera, et cetera, a lot of those people were PhDs. And I think we feel very confident that the, and the educational enterprise at the PhD granting level is absolutely stellar and it will stay that way. But if we want to advance the neuroengineering, cognitive health, and well-being, is all that going to come from PhDs to start companies and get acquired by Google? Or is some of this going to come from the undergraduate level, and can they join some of these big companies that are interested in doing this? And it's our job to think about how we educate them. And I don't have an answer, but I think even just having this dialogue is very productive in us thinking about this. So, yeah. By the way, DNN, Jeff's company, had three people in it. Jeff and two of his graduate students. <laughs> Exactly, PhDs. <laughs> so that problem we're confident about, but what about at the earlier level? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Ivan. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student here at UCSD. Uh, my formal training is in uh, previous, my undergrad is at the University of New Mexico in physics. Um, so aside from just uh, being completely fascinated by the brain and the biophysics of that and Neural computation. Um, I'm also uh, heavily involved in Native American, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, underrepresented people and their presence in STEM and the importance of that in terms of uh, getting healthcare to indigenous communities in the United States, but also all across the world. Uh, these uh, places require. Uh, technologies that are non-invasive and they require technologies that don't require experts to be there. So I, in the previous panel about uh, uh, the medical industry, I think it's all very relevant to that. And um, I got into the field, uh, I'd say probably when I was in middle school, I was interested in these binaural beats and how they could augment your dreams. And I think relating that to physics uh, was kind of the the initial uh, stimulus to, to draw me into this. Um, and it's, yeah, UCSD is a very, very collaborative university. So currently I'm co-advised by two professors, one in bioengineering and uh, neural computation and the other in mechanical engineering in a theoretical biophysics lab. Uh, so that's a bit about me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Mohamed Samabat. I am a PhD student at the EC department here at UCSD. And my research is at Salk Institute, working with Professor Sanofsky. It's an honor to be in this very collaborative lab with lots of students, great lab meetings, and learning from all different research topics. So my background was in wireless communications, electrical engineering wireless communications. I had four years of research on that area. And I am fortunate uh, that I had the opportunity to work on neuroscience, learning, and memory mostly, and then regarding the, my, I mean, the best I could do as a, to contribute to this uh, interaction between these disciplines, I was fortunate to be the president of a graduate student council at Jacob School of Engineering here at UCSD. So, and then before that, a year before that at EC department. So the good things about that was that I, we could have a new initiative to have uh, pizza talks on Fridays so students from six engineering departments were able to give the talk. We had among 50 to 70 audiences, um, and then half of them for pizza probably. But uh, uh, it was great because different disciplines from uh, different engineer engineering departments were coming, presenting their research. Bioengineering was a group of them. And then 
So it was a great collaborative uh, environment, so they could discuss things with each other, and then we had social events for them. So different engineering departments, students could see each other and talk to each other, and uh, first it was social, then it, ten, it may end to collaboration and learning from each other's uh, areas. And then based on my personal experience from wireless communication to learning and memory, I would later during this panel talk about the challenges you may see, even though, as Professor Sanofsky mentioned, there are lots of uh, attraction by Brain Initiative and others, but there are some challenges uh, that um, I think this panel can talk about that and we can provide some solutions or at least some questions so later it will be answered. Good, thank you. So, uh, Gerd, is there anything that you'd like to add at this point about where you wanted that question to go? Um, one of the things that um, I've noticed in, in the conversations we've been having is that part of the mission of the collaboratory, just to go again to talk about that, is that we, we talked about one of the key elements being the creation of a movement of scientifically and culturally literate students from diverse disciplines possessing a fluency in the role of science in the larger culture who could act as explorers and ambassadors in whatever role they later assumed in life, whether they were teachers, researchers, business leaders, politicians, physicians, lawyers, communicators, citizens with agile minds prepared to imagine tomorrow's world. So science and society scholars acting as agents of change at a time of very turbulent cultural evolution. Do you, I mean, so... Going a bit, bit beyond that in terms of the, the conversations we've had before about does interdisciplinary really go far enough? I mean, how do we... The conversation we had earlier in the previous panel very quickly had moved into social sciences and there was politics going on and so on. Do you, do you find that that's a conversational element? Those, are, those kind of elements turn up in your lab as well, that the, the students that you're working with... I mean, you were talking about something that's a politically sensitive issue as well. I had no idea that the constraints on the kind of engineering Im implements that you could use for those in its societies were, were not a clue. Well, yeah. now I know. Uh, you can tell me more. So, but those conversations, do they happen on a regular basis? Terry, you have it? No, you should go first. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I guess what I mean by that is uh, <coughs> if there are experts in clinical psychology or in uh, uh, therapy or in uh, uh, even just operation of MRI machines, that type of stuff is uh, less accessible for indigenous communities. Right. Um, just lack of experts, lack of, uh, lack of instrumentation. And so I think these engineering solutions that are non-invasive and portable, like as, such as uh, wearable monitoring, uh, that's more so where I see the future of, of this type of work being very beneficial to, to those communities. Right, okay. Can give a help. So, uh, there, you know, there's something I used to tell uh, my students who take my classes is uh, make sure you understand the personality of your professor because I did this when I was an undergraduate. When I was an undergraduate, I was trying to balance getting good grades with having a good time and partying. So I was always trying to figure out, can I figure out the personality of this professor? What makes them tick so I can predict what's going to be on the exam? So I can get the, you know, do the minimal amount of effort to get a good grade, and so then I can actually have a life. And so I, I sometimes get <laughs> frustrated with myself that uh, I actually kind of missed this when I started got into this technology. And one of my collaborators brought this to me, but it's really shaped how we think about our research. And so, you know, we got very interested in the wearables and how wearables can solve a lot of problems. And then I started collaborating with someone named Kevin King, who's in our department. Uh, he's also in the Department of Cardiology. And from his experience seeing patients, he experienced that a lot of the patients that have these conditions for which they keep re-entering into the emergency room, these patients are some of the most least adherent to doing anything. You know, so weigh yourself, over, you know, weigh, weigh yourself every day to make sure that your chest is not filling up with lungs because you might have heart failure. Good luck. They're not going to do it when they're at home. And so he, began, he sort of taught me the spirit of combining innovation and engineering with really understanding the people who are going to be using this. And you can actually really think outside the box and sort of be creative. And so, you know, he put us along this path of basically measuring physiology without requiring, requiring someone to wear anything 
And this is something that could be uh, very beneficial in particular to these groups. And so the takeaway lesson from this is, um, you know, me almost remembering what I tell others and I had forgotten to do it for myself is not just focusing on innovating and building something that's really exciting and has great performance, but really beginning to understand the personality of the people who might benefit this both and what constraints does that apply from an engineering perspective. And I think that that mindset is something that can be applicable to all engineers, no matter how they come from, and this is something that we can train all engineers to do. So it's a principle almost of design, understanding the personality of people who use it, and we can really uh, you know, solve important problems that we couldn't otherwise. So that's a learning lesson. I failed <laughs> from my own success, and then you know went full circle, yeah. <laughs> Can we just get the mic, John? Otherwise, we're going to miss the uh, catch. No, sorry. <laughs> Material. You're... It's a construction. No, no, I was just, I was asking. Oh. I was going, he said he had a light. I go, what, what's a light? Oh, anyway, oh college. Okay. <laughs> you talk about that later. <laughs> Terry. Terry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, one of the talks yesterday really struck me as being very relevant. This, I forgot her name from USC. Seedball. Right. Uh, um, Maryam. 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 That's right. Maryam. Uh, and and uh, she was trying to do something there that I thought was impossible, which is how do you use, how, first of all, how, how do you know whether the brain is happy or sad or <laughs> depressed? I, you know, and she, I wouldn't have guessed it, but she found a way of decoding that. And, and so, gee, that's great. Uh, but then she designed a feedback system to actually go in <laughs> and modify it. How great is that? I mean, my God, I mean, that, that has a, could have a huge impact. But, uh, but I, th I want to put that into the context of, the, of the, what's going on right now in society. There's a tremendous amount of conflict. And I don't know if you're aware of it, and I wasn't until I ran into it, which is that there's an epidemic of loneliness on campuses. And it's not just here in the U.S. And, uh, you know, I don't know why it's here or where it's here, but uh, it's extremely, I mean, you know, they're, they're, you, you, who knows where to point the finger. Maybe it's the cell phones have focused people, you know, uh, to, to sort of focus on their cell phone rather than have a social interaction uh, with real people. But whatever the reason, I think we, we, you know, we, these are our students and these are our, our communities. And, and you know, I, I really hope that uh, we have a way to help uh, students who are having these problems. And, you know, I, 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 I'm curious to know what other people's experiences are. But uh, yeah, we, we, we talked on, <clears throat> touched on this on, on the last panel, and there were a couple of comments. Mm -hmm. Mohammed, do you want to say something there? Just, <clears throat> So uh, regarding the loneliness, I think, I mean, as a personal experience and talking to the students, m maybe based on that uh, experience I had, I think the main source is comparison. So students, in terms of grades, in terms of the number of likes or number of uh, attractions of others by others, by comparing themselves in terms of grades, in terms of amount of demand for collaboration, for social interaction, those uh, comparisons is the main source of having this decision, hey, to, hey, I am alone, or nobody love me, or nobody like me, or I don't, there is no lots of demand in terms of interaction with me and others. So comparing our self, so we should go to the topic of self, comparing ourself with others and our achievements will end up most of the time with the, because there is a higher, higher, there is a hierarchy. Or maybe we should change the norms and put the grades or put the number of likes or the number of, in Instagram and all of these social media away or define them in a classes. So, student, so then by those classes, students, when they know what is the values, they don't depress when they see the number of likes or the number of reactions to their posts in Facebook, Instagram, and other social media. So this is what I think. Andrea, do you have a comment on this? I also think this would be a great opportunity to listen to people in the audience too. Yeah. And after we're done talking, let's let people in the audience Go comment ahead. on this. I think so. I mean, I think it's a very complex problem um, and it's about raising healthy humans in a way. 
I mean, if a student is going to define themselves by being a student rather than by who they are, then that's a problem from the outset. And that's going to that's gonna set you up for needing to compare X student to Y student because you've then defined yourself as a student. If you just defined yourself as a scientist or a professor instead of a person, just like any other person, you're setting yourself up for a lot of stress, actually. How do you survive being a, an assistant professor if you define yourself that way? So really raising healthy humans, I think, is very... Uh, preventative and I mean there are there are a lot of things about health um, that go far beyond uh, the physical health but mental health and physical health you know are so tied and mental health is the, the brain is an organ just like everything else and people seem to treat it as like okay all this is emotional problem and <laughs> all this is something we talk about and really the healthy human should be an integrated being in a body, in a culture, um, and, the, and the brain is a big part of that, and how you conceive of yourself even, and others, and um, learn how to make connections early on, both with your internal system and with external systems, super important. So I just, you know, I want to kind of reset too, like you can, you can take it from adolescence on up or you can think about what it means to be human. And I think humanity is a little on the rough side these days, actually, in my opinion. Um, so I'm an undergraduate student here at UCSD, so it's very interesting hearing like professors and PhDs perspectives. And I guess going along the lines of preparing the next generations, um, there's a lot of student activities on many campuses, but I feel like there's a huge disconnect between the actual academic and professor side with the student organizations compared to, ac or to um, companies. A lot of companies make us feel like, say, for a diverse student, like I'm of Hispanic descent and a Native American descent, a woman from a very small town, right? Um, and so I find it easy through my own student orgs to feel like I don't identify as just purely a student, and that's what's getting me through college and getting me through... Dr. Coleman's classes, um, <laughs> but I guess how can you do? How do you think you can make yourselves more available, such as these companies make themselves available to feel like we feel so comforted to go to companies because they're like, we want diversity, we want inclusion, we want you to be here. Whereas the academic field, I feel like is still in that kind of behind. And I know it's a slow institution to grow, but it seems like we do have people here that are invested in that, and it's kind of like I want to hear you guys' perspectives on how you're trying to fix or help alleviate that kind of isolation that we feel through. I guess student groups, yeah. Well, I can say, oh, go ahead, Marissa, please do. Sorry, I just wanted to comment on like the loneliness that you say people experience on campuses. I had the, um, a little bit of a nice experience to where I could differentiate between two groups of students because I did a bioengineering major with a very small class of like 40 or so students. And I did another major in neuroscience where there were hundreds of students. And I can tell you, I don't know a single person from my neuroscience major to, at all. I can't even remember a single name. Um, and if I had just been in that major, I think I would have felt a lot more alone than in my biosystems major because I had access and was able to create relationships with the students in my classes and the teachers that I had. So I think we discount a lot the, not only the student to teacher ratio, but the class size and, you know, students don't have the, um, courage to go up to other students and say, hey, can I form a study group with you and get the support that they need, they feel very much on their own, especially if you're a student coming in who's from a different background or is older or something like that. Right. So I think encouraging, you know, student groups or, you know, just, I, I mean, I know it's hard to do call it smaller class sizes and stuff like that, but um, my experience with biosystems definitely made my time here a lot less lonely than it would have had I been in a larger major. Thank you. Talk to you. Yeah, can I comment on that too? I totally agree, because Cog Sci used to be a boutique major, and now it's gotten very large. And, and the scalability of um, having social settings in education is really a tough thing to pull off, and it's very, very important to think about those things, actually. Yeah, 
I also want to comment back on that because right now I'm actually about to finish my PhD and I was interested maybe in applying for faculty positions and I was really shocked what you were talking about the diversity in terms of like academics versus uh, industry. I'm not going to name the university but I've seen cases of like you have uh, 40 faculty professors and only six are women. From these six women I don't think there is even anyone from like for example I'm also Hispanic background. So I think in order to solve this, we should promote diversity at all levels. I think industry is, I personally believe they are more ad advanced in that. And then we also promoting a lot of diversity in students, but I think this should also go for like fac faculty positions as well. So maybe this is a way to, to, to look into that. I was extremely shocked. I couldn't believe it. Um, yeah, just personally sharing that. Well, diversity is good for science. I mean, how did good things come from biology, from diversity of genes, right? I mean, you, diversity is good for the way people think because everyone's going to come at it from a different perspective. So the idea of diversity is a, is a good thing we should all strive for. But also, if you're just keeping to your scientific ideals, it should be quite diverse because everyone's going to come and think about things in different ways. So... Yeah, I haven't a clue, but is it, do, does anybody know any statistics about the proportions of students in engineering, say, who go into academic lives versus industry compared with other? Um, Bruce, you might know something. What I remember from EE at Illinois was that something like 20% went on to graduate school total. Right. Is out of a top-ranked department, so 80% were going to industry right off with a bachelor's wow. degree. I think bioengineering is more like 30, 30 40 percent are going to grad school, 20 percent to med school, which will lead to half of them going into in industry. So those are the kinds of numbers, I think. Professor Doyle? Did you? Yeah. Anyway, so I was going to say, um, I've been thinking a lot, of, as you, if you heard my talk about diversity, and and the idea that why we build complex architectures is to create sweet spots out of diversity. And what we do in society is we, do, we have treated diversity in two ways, segregation and assimilation. And the la assimilation is way better than segregation, but, but I think there's a third thing, which is to try to create these diversity sweet spots, which we're not very good at as a society. And biology does it really well. And, you know, that was the theme of my talk, which is we have these layered architectures and we have speed accuracy trade-offs and we, we create these layered architectures that give us speed and accuracy that none of our parts have. And so I think we need to do a much better job of that. And uh, What and, does that mean in practical terms, I mean, what do you, how, how do you do that? Well, in the nervous system, it's that we have, you know, big, big axons when we need speed and lots of axons when we need accuracy. In, in um, I think, again, I, the, the, society, the societies that I have seen, in, in the, at least in large animals, like I said, there's three of them, and they're organized completely different than we are, and they're completely different from each other. Um, but one thing I would say they all have in common is that the, the leaders of those groups are all postmenopausal females. And... Uh, so, and males have no political or social role whatsoever. Now they're complete. What, the what about post-menopausal men? <laughs> so, yeah, so, the, the, so. That's good too. Um, now, but the point is, uh, you, you can't just say, oh, it's just matriarchies because the most genocidal mammal on the planet are meerkats and they're matriarchies. So matriarchies per se, it's architecture. So what you want to do is you want to have leaders that are not interested in anything near term, not interested in short term, and uh, are really care about the future because all their, in this case, in these three cases, all their genes are in their great great grandchildren, and uh, and they would die for the they would die for the pod they would die for the true, but they're but humans aren't organized like that at all. I want to make some comments, but first I'll say that there is something common about these 
the, at least the species that you mentioned, that they're all fission fusion societies, and that's also what we are. Yeah. Uh, when we are on campus, something else happens. But I also wanted to note uh, my experience where, where pockets of diversity can come from. So UCSD, when I started here, there were 8,000 students, and now they're close to 40,000. And a lot of what I see from a student body of 40,000 undergrads is a little bit depressing. Uh, there is kind of a mob mentality. You have 700 students in uh, two classrooms. One class, the professor is talking. In another class, there's an overflow. And, um, but, there, but the other part of the scaling is something that I saw in the last couple of years working with uh, Colleen Emenegger from the Design Lab. She's responsible for the automation group there, and I'm working in the contextual robotics, and we formed what we called an automation playground. And it came out of a, a project that we had to do for a Hyundai. And we, it started in the middle of the quarter, so we went to talk to a class, and we, 30 undergrad students kept following us, coming to Saturday workshops, uh, going through the workshops, and when that project ended, they asked us to continue meeting. So we now have this group of students that are going with us. The power of undergrads here has to do also with where we are with technology. They are totally promiscuous. It doesn't matter what discipline they come from. Someone knows how to get on GitHub and look for code bits and do things, and someone else knows how to do video uh, stuff. So I think we're, we're, we're missing an opportunity here of actually engaging the undergrads in uh, experiencing the research cycle. Uh, and partly of what I see is the comment that you made about companies, that I'm surprised at how many undergrads who work with us on research projects weren't that interested in writing papers for conferences because they want to go and get jobs in the industry. So somehow we made undergrads think that continuing research and continuing science is you know, not such a great thing compared to what companies offer. Well, one quick counter argument that to remember is that for some groups, Education is a way out of poverty, right? It is a vehicle to support your family. And, and so part of people wanting to get a job is in part because they might, you know, have family members that are really counting upon them to help. So that is, that doesn't explain everyone. I think that's part of it. I was going to say one other thing, and then I'll shut up. And this is not my wisdom. This is the wisdom of someone else. And I'll never forget when I was a grad student, my advisor sent me to this workshop on mentoring that I got to experience. And it was... Uh, involved a gentleman named Bob Gray that some of you may know. And so he um, was a professor at Stanford, a famous uh, information theorist, and he won a, a presidential mentoring award. So he actually met President George Bush at the time for um, his efforts, and he had an amazing track record in mentoring women PhD students. And in fact, John's colleague at Caltech, who he mentioned in his talk, Michelle Efros, she did her PhD under Bob Gray. And so I got to just be on a fly, fly on the wall to watch this. And when all these, you know, remarkably successful women in industry and academia came up and spoke about their experience with him, it wasn't what I expected. What was interesting about how he successfully advised so many women was because his strategy was to treat everyone equally. And what they found is that when they were in many different environments, they felt like they were being treated uh, differently than others. Sometimes they're being a little... They're, they're, He's being a little easier on me as compared to how he's being on these men. And so what, you know, what these women found from working with Bob Gray is that you knew exactly what was expected, exactly what the plan was, and how you would be rewarded. And that his remarkably simple and uninteresting approach of treating everyone equally was the path to him having successful mentorship of all these women. So that's something that... I always remember, this is not coming from me, this is coming from my experience at this workshop. So I have a uh, <clears throat> footnote about uh, companies. So um, I organized a uh, graduate training program in computational earth science. This goes back almost 20 years now. Um, we had an IGER grant, and one of the requirements was that our students do uh, summer internships in companies. And, and so, uh, I called around, Qualcomm, sure, we'd love to have your students. In fact, we want to hire them. <laughs> so I asked, well, what do you look for when you're going to hire a student? You know, thinking that all this great math that we're teaching and the, the great research that they're doing is, is, going to, is, is what they're looking for. No. The first thing that they said they're looking for is a good team player. <laughs> right? They, they don't want people writing papers uh, and, and, you know, that are going to glorify them. They want someone who can work together with other people and... and create a product. And then I said, okay, what's the second most important thing? 
good communicator. And you know, if it's you know we're, we're 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 our our value system seems to be a little bit off here. Uh, the other thing, uh, a, a little of, of interesting footnote about uh, one of our faculty, Javier Movellan, who was at INC for many years and uh, ran a, uh, a a machine learning lab, uh, uh, machine perception, and uh, started a company, Motion, and that of course is a roller coaster. But he ended up. Uh, the company was bought by Apple, and so I so I asked him, you know, what is it like? I mean, it's a completely different uh, environment, and he said, Terry, it's really exciting. He said that the the time scale here is compressed. You know, in academia, the the, the, the projects last a couple of years, basically the lifetime of a graduate student. <laughs> but here, we you know, projects are people or teams are put together. We work for a couple of weeks, it goes out the door, and then there's another project. And you know, in other words, the, 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 it's, it's all sped up. And, and he says it's very exciting, but I, I was thinking it might be a little tiring too. <laughs> but it's interesting how the culture is different. And, and I think it's, uh, and, and I think it's good that academics have longer time scales because we do need to think on, on those time scales. But it's also clear that society needs places like companies where uh, the turnover is quicker, and you do are you are looking at uh, uh, the near the nearer term. Although I'm not I'm not saying that the quarterly uh, model is the right one, but you know having a, a a vision that is somewhere in between is probably what we should be aiming for. Short comment: uh, six out of forty is still a sorry state. When I was getting my doctorate uh, in '92. Uh, UCLA had 2% faculty women, 2%. If you have one. So, apologies, I have uh, I lost my voice. So, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, I came like five years ago from Middle East, and um, I did my bachelor over there. I didn't finish it and I came here. I did my bioengineering bachelor. Uh, I'm a senior right now. Uh, one thing I noticed with students is that the value of what they're doing. So you ask a student like, okay, you're focused on your uh, brain machine interface, uh, why you're doing this. Um, the answer for that is, <laughs> It's like sometimes silly or funny or they just want to do it because it's cool or I want to do my doctor. I want to be a doctor because I'm going to make a lot of money. And I always think about this as like, where is that coming from? And some people here say, well, in high school, they don't teach them uh, why they're actually studying or why they're actually learning. So <clears throat> my question is that how this can be fixed because um, college students, I would say the majority of college students are don't know what they're doing uh, and the few of students are knowing what they're, and to prove that, these workshops and stuff, I bet most of the students don't know that. I, I, I to be honest, I, Dr. Bruce told me about the uh, workshop and I didn't realize how advanced and how much I learned uh, in the last like in, in those two days so uh, how we can just let everyone knows about this and teach students how to learn actually um, and learn values like why they're the reason behind having a degree so <clears throat> Can I say something about, about that, uh, just briefly? Yes, of course. Um, I, I think you're totally right. As an, as an undergrad, uh, coming to workshops like this or, or going to a, a conference, I think is like the best way to, to learn about what you are interested in and also realize how little you know. But, uh, but not to be uh, overwhelmed by that. I mean, I recently went to an SFN uh, conference and uh, it's very overwhelming. That's Society uh, for Neuroscience. Yeah. 
but it's also extremely inspiring. Um, and and it's because I'm talking to people that are my age, and, and they're also like, hey, I don't know anything either, but we're trying, and, and this is these are problems worth working on. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think anything is very clearly defined in terms of what's the right path or whether to go to industry or not. I, I think um, it's, it's self-discovery, right? But it's, part of it is being confident in, in, in failing, right? It's, it's okay to go down a path and, then, and realize that, well, it's not for me or, um, you know, I'd rather be doing something else. And, um, you know, of course, there's like a cultural and societal and family, family considerations to make. Um, but yeah, you're doing the right thing. Just just put yourself in these situations. Like I saw your post; it was excellent, and you, and you printed it, and people were surprised when they they learned that you're a senior design group and not a PhD student, right? A student. Oh, oh okay. And then, how many went to? Um, so, I'm a PhD student here right now. I just uh, first year PhD student. See here, and I did my undergrad in bioengineering at UCLA. And one thing I, and so, so to speak about um, diversity within undergraduate education, um, so at UCLA there's this growing program called the Learning Assistant Program that I was um, a part of. And so what basically the goal of this program was to bring uh, undergraduates into education of other undergraduates. So um, basically, there's this problem with like minority groups where they feel like this barrier towards learning STEM topics. They feel like it's you know something that's untractable towards them, or they had never thought about it before. And then they go into these classes, and then you know like um, part one of the classes I was part of was like a physics for life science students class, and it just really scared them off because they had they didn't want to touch physics, they didn't want to you know um, learn about it at all. But what this program did was basically we, they brought this. It started off as a small group of um, faculty and students, and it started growing to like the other, um, like mo more like fundamental like STEM level classes. But basically, they would take these undergraduate students who had already gone through the class, and then teach them about like meta learning. So they would teach them like how students learn. So it, it benefits the student, like the undergraduate who's going to teach themselves, and it helps them. Um, teach the other students, and so what they did was um, they brought the undergraduates into like dis discussion sessions, so that they could help the other undergraduates because they have, at the undergraduate level, talking to other undergraduates who went through the class, um, we saw really helped um, the students feel like the problem was more tractable because the undergraduates who already went through it could relate to um, like the problems that they were going through and. They could teach them, coming from other undergraduates, they could teach them, you know, effective evidence-based learning strategies in the literature on how they, um, how to study for their courses. So it becomes a more tractable problem to them because some students just, you know, they just like, their only way they know how to study is like, you know, make flashcards, you know, just read through notes or whatever, but they don't have like this exposure to, you know, other forms of learning, other evidence-based approaches towards um, learning. And so that was one thing that I thought was, you know, an interesting approach into um, undergraduate education and also um, education for minority students. Go ahead. I'll be a little more blunt. I'm the president for the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, so I definitely asked that question to see kind of your responses. But I guess more of a if you're, whether you're from UCSD or not, I would say, yeah, my club is geared towards professional industry. Um, but I would say, like, me and people that do have the passion that I do to encourage and to educate, I think it's really important for professors, and I've said this at our town hall meetings, to just maybe give a shout out or to reach out. Like, most of our stuff is public because I will encourage, like, we have six diversity orgs. I won't name them all. It takes a while. But just to even like look out and just to maybe see is there a coordinator for that like can we come and talk like I have academic uh, academic uh, chairs that are trying to reach out to professors we're having a graduate roadmap here at UCSD teaching about can you go to grad school do you want to go to grad school and here's how to go to grad school and I guess I would kind of like a good time to say it kind of like a plug that you know students are really trying and it's kind of like also we would like to see kind of effort back 
because that's there, there are people like me that are going to try to be as receptive and kind of lose sleep and <laughs> make sure people that are like me and are not like me can still have that, like, that opportunity. Um, but I guess it's kind of like just saying, look out there for them. They're there. They're probably quiet. They don't know what they're doing yet. <laughs> we know what we're doing in our major. We don't know what we're doing with our lives. So it's kind of like the opportunity is there if you're ever guessing. And it's not like you have to do it at this level. Like you can come down and talk and I guess, yeah, type of thing. Just wanted to say You're optimistic? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry? Are you optimistic about this? I'm very optimistic. It's going to take a lot of effort and I feel like, you know, saying that we have an issue that people are so invested in short term. I went through po training programs just within my colleagues from the black edu the black community, the women community, the South Asian community, and we all say it's not for. I don't care what my legacy is for the 2019, 2020. I care about the legacy that's going to be here 10 years from now for my club, and so that I think that mindset is changing, um, especially in young people. It's definitely not. I don't care what people think of me. I care what people happens after me and who's going to lead after me and what's going to happen after that. Um, and so I think it's there and I think it can definitely go into academia. Just that you need to, the people will reach out to you, but also it's really nice to come and reach back. I've, a fourth year here, it took me forever to finally just talk to professors and be able to say, hi, <laughs> how's it going? <laughs> so yeah. Okay. There is that. Yeah, just um, briefly too. I think. Just bit, but here's a quick question for you all as we go out, because Dan, this is the same okay. question, because I think we have to close fairly soon. In this, because this will, <clears throat> you can answer this as, as your as your planning question. What are you optimistic about in the stuff that we've been talking about? What are you optimistic? I'm about? optimistic about young people doing things like that. Okay. <laughs> what are you optimistic? About? Uh, well, okay. I'm just going to add on to that. Uh, I'm optimistic about the fact that academia, we have the ability to sort of have this long-term outlook. You know, just for example, being a TA in the same class for multiple semesters in a row. Uh, one of the classes I love TAing is one where we're actively asking the students for feedback. So sometimes we get incredibly low marks on certain things that we try to change for the benefit of learning, of increasing collaboration, diversity. But And they mark us low, but one of the things that they actually tell us that they love is us admitting that we're doing something wrong and asking them for feedback and then iterating the next semester. And so I think academically, like these are some things. What? Truth? <laughs> Truth? Truth, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great virtue. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, long-term outlook on just course education is something I think is cool. easy to improve. Cool. Um, I totally agree with that. Um, just to change a little bit gears, I'm very optimistic between the collaboration between academia and industry. I believe, like, um, Entities like, for example, Microsoft Research or Google Brain or all these places, they already have professors that are moving there and there is collaboration happening. So I believe that um, both together can do something even better, um, both in terms of funding, but also in try trying to change a little bit the mindset from these companies to trying to build technology that can really help society or, for example, some of the things that we talk here about. Um, health and well-being, I really think we should all work together in order to um, really succeed. So I have a phrase which fits much better onto campuses that have semesters and not quarters. <laughs> 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 but it's uh, the reason that I love this job is uh, springtime comes twice a year in August and January. <laughs> And at UCSD and the, much of the Cal system, it's October, January, and April. <laughs> the energy that shows up on campus is just spectacular. All right. So I'm optimistic about optimism. <laughs> How many of you out there remember the negative nabobs of negativism? <laughs> nattering nabobs, nattering nabobs. <laughs> No, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of negativity out there, but I actually think that um, there is a, a need for uh, looking at the brighter side, and, and I think that to some extent it's beginning to, to happen um, in, in, in many areas. I mean, you know, it, it's uh, optimism in, in uh, different areas of science. It's a great time to be getting started. Uh, but I also think in, in uh, our communities that uh, we have, and I, you know, it's, it, there, there are problems. You introduce a new technology, and it takes a while to understand the, the shortcomings and the 
you know, unintended consequences. But, but the, the good parts that are coming out, and I'll just give one example. Somebody mentioned uh, uh, learning how to learn. Well, that's, I have a MOOC on learning how to learn. And I've taught 2,000 students in my lifetime, around you know, a few thousand students. But there are 3 million people who have taken this, uh, uh, this MOOC, and it's, it's to help so it's people number, learn, number one, become number better one. learning yeah. learners. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the, the most popular, but widely popular. Uh, but I get fan mail every day, and I'm serious. Uh, you know, uh, there there are people who say, I, "I wish I'd taken this course when I was in high school." Uh, and oh, thank you so much because it really has helped my daughters. You know, who are having trouble in school, and and, and it's it's really uh, satisfying. It's like uh, you ha you feel that you've actually had an impact, and so I, I really think that uh, there is there's. there's that the, the, the internet is, is really providing a completely new channel for reaching people. And by the way, it's uh, ages 10 to 90, 200 countries. Uh, it, it's, it's really, uh, you know, the, hasn't, the potential hasn't even been tapped yet. This is, it, it will, well, you know, I really am, am optimistic that education really is going to be transformed someday by both uh, the internet but also by machine learning. I think that's going to individualize <laughs> education. Uh, I'm optimistic, just generally as an engineer, uh, that the passion of men and women to continue to create and understand and understand by creating um, will not diminish. It will only continue to increase. Um, and I hope that more good comes out of this than bad. Um, but I'm optimistic. And you're optimistic. You always are. <laughs> Uh, I'm optimistic because uh, I think we're at a, at a unique point uh, in history where if we take a look at the cost, the percentage of GDP that goes into using conventional forms of medicine to treat people, et cetera, et cetera, there are all of these problems that are really going to require people from different perspectives to get together to solve them. And when these big problems occur that can really affect, you know, the economy that can affect all these different issues, people I think are more willing to explore bringing different groups of uh, uh, people together in different perspectives that usually are not. And so I think because of these really important unmet needs to fix these problems in healthcare to make it sustainable, it's really going to welcome all of these creative approaches. And I think it's a, a very unique time for young people to take part in that. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm optimistic about the equalization of, I think, educational quality, um, given that, as Terry's mentioning, these online coursewares, there's MIT OpenCourseWare available for the undergrads here, as well as resources from every university, essentially. And I think that kind of reduces the, uh, the difference in, uh, in education, in training, essentially, that um, uh, with that given that the internet allows everybody to have the same educational resources uh, will definitely improve in the future. Uh, the quality of, uh, of education that everybody has. So yeah, I am optimistic about it as well, but because human brains, the ability to learn is the main uh, feature humans has and differentiate humans from other creatures. So we will figure out the problems and solve them by finding the solutions. So I'm optimistic as well. I have three, four sentences if this is the last chance uh, this we is have. The last chance. So, okay. Uh, so regarding the whole uh, interactions and comments here, I would like to say that regarding freedom of research that you pointed at and undergraduate, even graduates have no idea what they are doing. So to have freedom of research, choose the topic you want to work the topics you can work are limited by the funding proposals. So they are limiting uh, the professors, the area they accept the proposals, the students can work on them. And then it's more worsening in the engineering side because there are less funding sources for electrical engineers, information theorists, and other theory, uh, the theoretical researchers. And there is more uh, research for them, freedom in life sciences, at least four or five top research areas, I think, in CNL we have access to or more. Um, so I see more freedom of research in life sciences. 
And then uh, regarding the area that you said about they have no idea what they are working or why they are working, it's because they don't know the areas. So it's a question that always uh, graduate students and undergrads ask, what is your research interest? Okay, they cannot have a research interest because they don't have lots of research experience. So about human brain, okay, it says all faction, it, it, it has auditory systems, it has vision, it has memory, it says all of these. So I picked the learning and memory, I feel, and I had the experience on all faction. The rest of the brain that are hundreds of other areas is just untouched from me. So it's hard to have a research interest. The best way to have some uh, taste of this menu is to have some transition courses uh, in the syllabus of the university. Some uh, passionate students uh, catch up them online, Spy Course Era or other uh, YouTube clips even, but if we have them in the syllabus and they are required called transition courses, so in a lower, uh, heavy, uh, less heavier level, so students can transit and learn about the areas. Imagine in EC you want to take a general relativity or takes molecular. I did this, just wanted to try how hard is it. I took the molecular and cellular neurobiology. It was 16 uh, sessions each session Rusty Gage came and talked about neurogenesis. Uh, people come talks about the tumors and other areas, but it was very heavy. I tried this and I see how heavy is this for these types of transition. So more transition courses should be there. And then regarding the point uh, the lady at the, uh, the beginning said that um, students should have the view, how, is, how they view themselves regarding they are human, they are not a student. So the problem in our education system, I found it is just, I can compare it to a microscope. We need to have some telescope view in our education system. We just focus and zoom in in our research, in our courses, and students are lost because they are very zoomed in. We need some big picture view in terms of research, in terms of our identity. And after we finish our PhD, we just walk around and see who we are, what we should do, what are the values, because we are very zoomed in, so we need a telescope view. And then the last uh, statement I had is for the topic of these sessions that was transitions between engineering and neuroscience, how they col collaborate. As Professor Sonofsky mentioned, uh, they have, uh, there are lots of attraction by B Brain Initiative and other um, initiatives. Engineering like to join and have some collaborative projects, but there is a reason that this is slowed down and somehow blocking that and some of them get, uh, go away. Where is the outcome of these researches? Courses, uh, students, collaborations, all of these are good and we can have them, but they are blocked by publications. The research results are published in journal papers in a language that no other disciplines far away can understand. So when electrical engineering read the nature or science or other journals, it's really hard to catch up. And the other, the, the other way, information theory. If you pick up an information theory paper and you start reading, a person in an area close to that, it's hard to understand. In a circuits, it's harder. In materials engineering, harder. And then if a biologist want to understand it, well, good luck. <laughs> so this is, this, this is one of the critical things should be solved, the publications where students or researchers or research scientists want to understand the materials, they want on, it's really hard to catch up with them. It may take a month or two months because yeah, you, you, you look at the word synaptic efficacy, you see synaptic strength, you need, you, and then you go to Wikipedia and you see they are linked to hundreds of other names and they are links to hundreds of other names. You just see you are lost, so you give up on doing research on this area. Well, I love because I, passionate to do some research that benefits a huge number of people. So I said that I must do that. And Professor Sanofsky and the other research scientists that were patient enough so we can do research on this area and have some uh, outcomes. And, and it was successful. And what I want to say that this is the real challenge, publications, journal papers. Yes, sorry, it takes time. Oh, so, okay, right. So you want to be the Dean of Engineering then, basically. <laughs> Thank you. All right, but you're optimistic. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, that was a great panel. Thank you very much. Also, the questions were wonderful. Gert, do you want to take over now? Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>